غرباء ولغير الله لا نحمي الجبال غرباء وارتضيناها شعار للحياة غرباء 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 إن تسل عنا فإنا لا نبالي بالطغاة نحن جود الله دوما دربنا درب الأبا نحن جود الله دوما دربنا درب الأبا غرباء 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 This project started towards the end of uh, 2004 uh, when I was still in New York and the idea was to uh, facilitate Arabic education for Muslims across the country uh, and the philosophy really I had was that uh, one of the obligations and really responsibilities of Muslims is to be educated in their deen and one of the biggest obstacles and us being properly educated in Islam is really the Arabic language because the primary sources of the religion are in Arabic at the same time as it's a responsibility, collectively, I also believe that Muslims have a right, not just a responsibility, they have the right to a quality education that is accessible to every Muslim man, woman, and child. And they should have a quality education, at least in the Arabic language, which opens the doors to other areas of learning, be it Quran or Sunnah or you know, any other area. So when I first started learning Arabic for myself, it was a very difficult uh, uh, journey from you know, one teacher to another, to another, to another. And I didn't have the luxury to be able to travel abroad or to spend a lot of money to go to a university to do a degree in Arabic, etc. I was very much hand to mouth as a student. So when I went through whatever journey I went through to get to a certain level in Arabic, I felt, well, if I really wanted to learn it this bad and I had to go jump through all of these hoops, I'm sure there are people that are far more passionate about learning this stuff than I am and they don't have these opportunities. So you know, something has to be there that creates this opportunity. So when I started this project in uh, New York, Alhamdulillah, we started at a masjid that I used to live in, uh, in, Long, in Long Island, in Bayshore, and the response was just incredible. And word of mouth spread and requests started coming, can you do the same program, like a short Arabic class for the Muslim community in New Jersey? Can you do one in Connecticut? Can you do one in Maryland? And just no advertising, no radio, no flyers, nothing. Uh, barely a website at the time and just word of mouth it kind of started uh, spreading to the point where it got out of control so uh, alhamdulillah it's been I mean that's where we started uh, and now alhamdulillah I have just a fantastic team of colleagues um, that are just increasing by the day and I'm constantly looking for new talent as well myself and my colleagues included we must have vis visited over at least 180 masajid all over the country all alhamdulillah over. all over yeah all over the US <laughs> Can I take the plead the fifth on that one? But uh, I'll say Irving, right? I'll say Irving. Okay, <laughs> Irving is absolutely one of my favorites, though. Alhamdulillah. I, I came here in 2007. I taught. Some of you might remember. I came here and taught in 2007, and I came with my brother-in-law. We're both from New York, and when we came here, I'm teaching the class upstairs. We had about 85, 90 students, and there was a volleyball tournament going on between uh, the Irving brothers and the brothers from I think ISAT or the central masjid or something and the guys at Irving were getting clobbered I mean they were getting destroyed but uh, well, I didn't know I was just you know enjoying the fact that there were bleachers back there and people watching a game and my brother-in-law and I you know we're from New York we don't really see that kind of activity so we're like this is this Eid? did we miss the like what's the party about? <laughs> so we kind of decided to move here but long story short um, after all these years of traveling uh, the idea the virus that got planted in my head was we need to create like a serious program, not just something that introduces people to Arabic, but an actual proper alternative to traveling abroad to study Arabic over here in the US. And by Allah's grace and really miraculous help from Allah and completely unexpected, uh, uh, overwhelming support from all over the country, we were able to set up our mini campus right here across in what used to be the Nokia headquarters. So we're, we've taken up the fifth floor and we've, we've started our program, alhamdulillah. And so far so good, inshallah ta'ala. That's good. So uh, I've heard actually news about uh, next year planning, but... Yeah, yeah, we, uh, we started our uh, registration for next year. 
Uh, and those of you that want to know more about it, inshallah, I'll maybe towards the end of this program I can talk to you folks about it. But what, but what I'm looking for is high school graduates and older that are brave enough to spare a year of their academic life. It's 10 months long and the next batch starts in uh, 2011 September. It starts in September uh, uh, 20th or so, inshallah. And already, I mean, we, it's been a couple of weeks since we opened up registrations and uh, I don't have any Dallas applicants yet, but we have several applicants from outside the, uh, the Dallas area already. Alhamdulillah, so I'm hoping we see some more local uh, participation this year, inshallah. So let's get down to the gritty and uh, what role does a Muslim team play in today's high school and college and also even to the point of the last question of being a young professional? Okay, so, so one thing at a time. Right, right? one thing at a time. Uh, okay. The thing is that, you know, uh, when we're talking about the, the team growing up in high school, the pressures and, and all the different, uh, you know, peer pressure that they get and the different uh, levels of expectation that the parents have at home, how can you uh, show them, you know, give the perspective? Of the I have kind of a weird perspective on this. Um, to just be totally frank with everyone here, I feel less in a position to tell you how you should be in high school because I was pretty messed up in high school myself. But, <laughs> but I can tell you of some things that, I, uh, that I've seen work. And I want to start with um, a recognition that there are two ways you can look at Islam. There's really two main ways you can look at this deen in your life. And one of those ways is, well, what's the bare minimum that this religion wants from me? And after that, it can leave me alone and I can do what I want. In other words, just tell me what I cannot do. The absolutely bad, bad stuff that's going to land me straight to hell. Tell me that stuff. I won't do that stuff. And everything else, I'll just do what I want to do. That's how I want to live my life. I want to be free from the shackles of religion, basically. Okay? And this is actually uh, the way most young people look at any religion. Most young people look at a religion as a way, it just tells me not to do things. It stops me from living my life, right? Be it, you know, uh, uh, strict or conservative Christianity or Judaism or even conservative, uh, you know, aspects of, of Islam or whatever. You know, whatever it may be, it's, this, it's keeping me back from, you know, living it up, so to speak, you know. And high school is being pushed, and it's been pushed forever, as the, like, the golden years of your life. That's when you really should be partying. How many high school movies do they make, right? About how you should be going and doing whatever you possibly can in high school, because after that, real life sets in or whatever. On the other end, there's another way of looking at Islam. And the other way of looking at Islam is that we were brought, we were given this gift of Islam, not chains. Islam is not chains that are shackling us. We were given this gift, and this gift gives us this really high purpose. I wasn't sent on this earth to party. I was sent on this earth to do some, an amazing task. And there's a huge population on the earth who Allah decided He will not give them the gift of Islam. They didn't deserve it like I did. Allah gifted me with Islam. And the best years of my life that I can serve Islam with are what years? My, my early years. The, the, the youth of my life is the best part of my life that I can serve Islam with. Now these two very different points of view. One point of view asks, what's the least I can do? And get by. And the other point of view asks, what more can I do? I want to do more. I want to help other people see how awesome this deen is, etc. And you know, what I've come to realize is, uh, if I use sports terminology for a second, you know how we talk about defense and offense? If your team's on the defensive, what's already the case? When, when your team, whether, whether you're playing football or basketball or whatever, if you're on the defense, what seems to be the case? You don't have possession. The other side does, right? And if you're on defense most of the time, that's a pretty good indication that you are winning or losing the game. You're losing. Because you're constantly on the defensive. That's how you are in basketball. Right, that's how I'm on defense, yeah. So <laughs> That's why this happened. So, but anyway, th this idea of you know holding back and saying we just have to at least take care of defend a few of the things that Islam wants us to, and the rest of it you know we can let go. What you're asking for is in eventual failure. You're gonna eventually it's gonna you're gonna start making the list of things the no nos. You're gonna make that list shorter and shorter and shorter until there's nothing left. On the other hand, the winning attitude is really offensive. What more can I do? And I want to give you, I, I've given this example in a khutbah here before, I want to share that example with you. Uh, I'll, I'll keep uh, my friend's name anonymous. But he went to high school, and when he, uh, before he went to high school, he was in a Hibs program. 
So you memorize Qur'an, and you know, when you memorize Qur'an, of course you're sitting in the masjid with other kids that are memorizing Qur'an, you're with the, the hafiza most of the time, then you go home and you review Qur'an, and you're just surrounded by this really pure gathering all the time. And then he's done, now he's going to high school, and he tells his parents, I want to go to public school. Right? And his parents say, you? You want to go to public school? You're a hafiz! You can't go to that terrible environment. You're going to get all messed up. And you know what he says? He says, well, I learned, I just learned Allah's book. And the people who need to hear about Allah's book the most are the people in high school. I want to, they have to know what this is. I feel, I feel responsible. Why should I hide what I have? I feel a responsibility to share. I feel bad for those people, right? So they put him in public high school. By the time he graduated high school, 16 kids had taken shahada. 16 kids had taken shahada. Now, what I'm talking about here is an attitude not of defense, but of what? Of offense. You see yourself as having something superior. So when I'm talking, especially young, young people nowadays, I feel like, I, I'm, I'm putting, the, putting you guys on the spot, I don't know for sure, but I'm, I, I guess I'm gonna stereotype. A lot of you, you're not proud of Islam. You're not proud of it. Like, this is, this is it, man. Everything else, I feel sorry for these people. Instead, what's happening to our girls, our daughters is, when they see some girl dressed a certain way, they say, oh, I wish I could dress like that. Too bad it's haram. <laughs> right? We see, our, we see other you know, kids, you know, boys, they're doing all kinds of things, and we say, oh, yeah, my parents wouldn't let me do that. It's apparently not allowed. Or something, you know? But the right attitude would be, I feel bad for that girl. Look at how she has to dress herself. How she has to put herself on display. She, she's looking for attention like that, while Allah has already given me attention by my, you know, by my Islam. All the dignity I need, all the recognition I need, Allah has already given me. Why do people do the kinds of ignorant things they do? You know what they're looking for? Is attention and respect. If you really have Islam, you don't, you're not looking for it anywhere else. You already got it. And when you find other people pathetically searching for it in other things, you can actually look down on them and say, I feel bad for you. Let me show you something better you can aspire to, you know? So that's, that's the kind of attitude that's really important, in, at least in, in high school life. When you were talking about college, I'll take two minutes more. When you're talking about college, um, in my opinion at least, at least in my, uh, in, in my experience, college is a time where you can, it's a world of ideas. Right, you get exposed to so much more. And you can go in so many different directions. And college is really the part of your life where you, it's, it's the formulating part of your life where you decide what the rest of your life is gonna look like. Really it's college, because true independence is in college. That's where you really truly decide what direction in life you're gonna take. Not just professionally, but what kind of person you're gonna be, how you're gonna carry yourself, what kind of priorities you're gonna have in life. All of that kind of comes from what you're gonna do in college. And a huge part of that is who you're around in college. If you're, a bunch of, if you're around a bunch of losers in college all the time, well guess what, you're gonna be one. If you're gonna be around a bunch of go-getters in college, you're gonna turn into one. That's what college is like. The thing to do in college, in my opinion, is to you know, have, of course, take care of your academics, but on the other side, be heavily, heavily, heavily involved in something like an MSA. Use your spare time to do some productive stuff. Whether it be putting programs together, or you're doing food drives, whatever it is you're doing, whether it's study circles or something, but the MSA to me is like a lifeline in college. And if you're not part of it, you're really, really missing out on something that's gonna hurt you way down the line. The role that the masjid is supposed to play in the life of a Muslim during college, the reality of it is that's what the MSA plays. And I know MSAs have problems and drama and all this stuff, is Ubaid here? His t-shirt, right? He made an MSA t-shirt that says, we know drama, right? So, <laughs> right? But, uh, but, but that's true. Nonetheless, the, the Muslim Students Association, I think, at least for me, was a lifesaver. Wallahi, was a lifesaver. Had it not been for the MSA, Allahu A'lam, I would have never met anybody who would make me want to commit myself to praying regularly. I wouldn't have met somebody like that. So, yeah, through the MSA, you know. And some of the great scholars we have going around nowadays are ex-MSA people. They, they came out of the MSA, you know? So don't trivialize it, don't think little of it. Really, you know, uh, make it a, a big part of your life in college, inshallah. And if your school doesn't have one, make one. You should be the one to make it. You should be the one to create it. And actually nowadays, so many high schools, I'm so proud of them, high schools are starting to make MSAs. I went to the MSA at uh, Ulis, the Trinity High School the other day. I was shocked, there was like 80 kids there. I was like, where did you people come from? 
you know. But subhanAllah, it, it's, it's a thing of pride when Muslims come together and they're trying to do something like that. So that would be my advice for uh, Kaj. What was that last thing again? When you become zombies and you get into the workforce? Yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's, the, that's the last bit, right? The, the thing of it is, uh, um, I'll just speak frankly, I think that Muslims uh, in this country, for a long time, we haven't been creative. We have not been creative. Our idea of a good career is limited to four or five things, and if your children are not graduating in these four to five fields, then they have failed in life. Right? They are, they are just, you know, what are you doing with your life? So if your son decides to, for example, get a bachelor's in history, you'll say, what are you doing? Is that why we brought you to America? To study history? No, no, no. Forget about history, worry about your future. <laughs> right? <laughs> and uh, do computer science, and do like accounting, and you know, if you can't, you know, do, okay, no, no. First, let's start with Jannatul Firdaus. Do med school, and then, you know, at least engineering, and if you can't do that, fine. A little bit lower, you know, kind of barzakhish, but you know, computer science. If you can't do CS, you can't be a programmer, at least do IT. Okay, fine, be an accountant. You know, oh, education, way at the bottom, education. <laughs> right, so we have these, like, we, we figure out that these are the careers that are successful, and we push those on to our kids. Listen, this is not the British Empire leaving Pakistan and India behind, and, uh, and the only careers left are the ones that the Brits left for us. This is not that anymore. There, this is a, really, I mean, I don't mean to be cliche, but it's a land of opportunity. Right? And there's so many creative fields that we could use Muslims in, and that you can, it's not just that it would be a great service to the community, but they can really be lucrative careers. So my first bit of advice would be, to first, you know, identify for yourself, and college is the time to do that, and high school is the early time to do that, identify for yourself, what are the subjects, and what are the areas of study or specialization that you find interesting, that you really like, genuinely like. And then in college, Find out, like, speak to professionals in that field, speak to counselors, advisors, and find out what kind of career paths are available in that field that you personally really, really like, and not, not just like, but you're good at. That, these are two things that are important. Because you can really like something, but you're no good at it. Right? Don't do that. Because <laughs> you won't get anywhere. And sometimes you're really good at something, but you don't like it at all. You're really great at it. You hate it though. And you go and do it anyway because you're good at it. And you know what happens? You're miserable your entire life. Because you hate going to work every day because you can't stand your job. Right? So it would be good, it would be, an, it would be an effort on your part to look for something A, that you really like doing, and B, that you're good at, and then pursue a career in that field, uh, inshaAllah ta'ala. And even if that doesn't happen, that's the ideal case, right? But even if it, that, that doesn't happen, have a career in which your life is not your career. Your life is not your career. I used to be in IT, back in the day, way before, you know, uh, this is, we're talking about the age of Pentiums and, you know, 380, so you guys don't know what that is. Okay, anyway, right, when Windows was the thing, right, so, but when I was in IT, you know what happened? Co technology was constantly changing. So to keep up in your career, what did you have to do? You, you're at work when you're at work, and you're at work when you're home, so you can stay at work the next day. <laughs> to keep up with your career. So your, career, your, your work basically consumes you. And you have no energy, no time left to do anything else with your life. That is it, that's all you are. You ever seen people that work so hard, every time you talk to them, all they can talk about is work? That's all they can talk about. They can't think of talking about anything else. Why? Because that's all their life has become, unfortunately. They're just the means to make some multi-million dollars company some more money. <laughs> that's all they've become, some, a cog in a machine. You have to have a career in which you have time left for yourself, for your family, for your community, for other things. A lot of people I know that were amazing in their MSA years. Man, these people were awesome. The moment their career started, they disappeared. We don't see, what happened to that guy? I don't know, he got a job. That's all I, last I heard of him, he got a job. That's what happened. They disappeared. We don't see them at masajid, we don't see them in programs, we don't see them you know, pursuing their, their, their study of deen. We don't, we don't see them. And in some, time, some cases, it's understandable, you're busy with family and things, you know. But, you know, it, it's something you have to be cognizant of. Don't lose who you were. Don't lose who you were. And if, if your children see you not having any activities outside of your career, and doing the groceries, you don't, they don't see you actively participating in wanting to learn the deen for yourself, 
in wanting to gain a better understanding, doing something for Islam, whether it be in the realm of da'wah or humanitarian work or whatever it may be, if they don't see that, how are they going to get inspired? You know. So these, these would be a, a, a few tidbits about just awesome. high school, college, and career. That's good. Coming back to the professional, mm -hmm. um, what, what do you think about money making? Because a lot of guys, because when I started making money, it was like, wow, my dad and my parents were giving twenty dollars a week, and that was happening. So uh, uh, beyond that, it was it was just uh, you know overwhelming. Uh, when the money started coming in. Right. Yeah. Exactly. When the money started coming in. Yeah. How do you control that? And and, and think about saving or spending or and that aspect of, of you know controlling it. Because I mean, a lot of times parents don't give their their children that that you know added um, independence from the beginning, yeah. in the early ages, and they have no idea how to manage money. Actually, uh, here it's it's. Um, at, at, at this part of the discussion, I'm very grateful that I was kind of my, my high school years were in New York, New York City, where most families live hand to mouth. So we don't have disposable income like we do in the South. Like here, life is very cheap. So generally, people are better off. And if you think you're not well off, go to New York. You'll see what, I'm what I mean, right? Where the entire family is working, and they're working 40 hours, even if they're in high school. Like I worked 40 hours throughout high school. And that was just, my, you know, my siblings work too. It's just a norm, you know? But one of the benefits of that was, it made us responsible with and appreciate hard-earned money. It makes you responsible in life. A lot of our youth, they haven't actually ever felt the need to take responsibility. They've never felt that need. They say, if I screw up, you know, I, I, you get a job at the Apple store, or you get a job at the mall, or you get a job somewhere, you know, you, you're helping out at high, high school or whatever, some extra money's coming in. But even that you won't take very seriously, because even if that doesn't go, if that goes away, well, you still got mom and dad. They'll take care of you. They'll take, you know, or, you know they'll, they'll spot you or whatever. My dad, early on, one of the biggest favors he did to me, he said, you're going to pay your own college tuition. You get it through your head. I said, okay. And I, you know, and... For the brothers, at least take it like a man and say, yeah, okay, I'll do it, I'll do it. And so from high school on, I was thinking like an adult. Like this is how I'm going to budget my money, this is where I'm going to go to college because I can afford to go here, this is how I'm going to manage my time. And uh, you know, uh, uh, this aspect of life, we're not giving our children. And we have to. They have to, if, if your kids are teens, a, a healthy thing for them is to get a job. It's healthy. It's not about the money. It's really not. And you have to make them responsible in you know, chores in the house and things like that. And this is, goes for brothers and for sisters. Get a job at the library. Get a job at the local, volunteer at the local hospital. So hospital, if you don't want to get a job, volunteer. Be part of the community center locally, something. But you have to be involved in something like that. It builds responsibility. So when you do run into money, you know how, you respect it. That it, it, it doesn't just you know, uh, uh, come, come out of trees. A lot of people have careers now and even they don't take their career seriously because you know what, in the back of their head, if this goes, at least I can move back in mo with mom and dad again. You know, they're, they're, in the back of their head, they're still on vacation. The time for vacation, you have to become independent. You really have to become independent. And you have to think like that and you have to think responsibly, right? As far as, you know, uh, um, the money coming in is concerned, Muslims should have, in my opinion, the, you know, the idea of we should, be a, we should ward dunya away and we should be people of akhirah is true. At the same time, Muslims, we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't have love of dunya, but I tell you, we should be the highest paid people in the country. Muslims should have the highest salaries. We should have the most successful businesses. And not because we want money, but we can pour that money into Islamic work. We can build infrastructure for future generations. We can't do that if we have nothing to work with. You follow what I'm saying? And the real strength of our times, the real power in our times is economic power. That's what real power is. You can have military power, or you can have economic power, and let me tell you, most of the time, economic forces even drive military forces. Right? Economics is the, is the currency of power now. Right? So we have to be empowered like that. But we have to maintain the balance that even if we are making loads of money, that our goal in life is not the money. The purpose is not that we make the money. The, 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 the income we're generating is for a higher purpose. It does something more with life, you know? So, and for this reason, we have to kind of balance the, the idea of good you know, entrepreneurial careers and businesses with, inshallah ta'ala, this, this, this giving spirit. Mm -hmm.
وجب الشكر علينا ما دعا لله دا أيها 